so I'm going to keep dwelling on the sprite editors. We're moving on to bigger and better things. Um, presentation. Try to, you know, you run it through it once before you do presentation. Just kind of figure out what's going on a little bit. Um, there's a little pop, you know, QT is a big powerful package. You should take advantage of some of that stuff. So buttons can have images as easily as text. So that's a good thing. Uh, I was a little surprised to see something like this where there's like, on the film strip of you know frames, there's like a select button down here. Just select this thing. This is a button too, right? There's like things you can do in QT. Don't don't fall back 50 years of your user interfaces. Try to have a modern, clean view of all this this kind of stuff. Uh, it's easy to make bad user interfaces. What's bad about that? <laughs> <laughs> This one is surprisingly brutal, right? Like, like even I couldn't invent that, invent this thing. <laughs> Why do you think this user interface is so complicated, first of all? Windows 98? That's not the only problem. The part that you should be spending the most time in, which is probably like yeah, I mean, actually, this is some bulk rename utility or something. I don't really know what it does, right? I can even look at the interface. I don't really know what it what it does. Um, but there's, actually, I think there's a fundamental reason this is a particularly complicated interface. And I want to something I have to guess. Well, it looks like they're giving them access to basically every single option available, where they could maybe hide some of that and, and let them access it through different channels or something. Yeah, so there's a lot of options. Why do you think a lot of options here? Where, where do you think this was? What kind of tool was this originally, do you think? Command line. Yeah, yeah, like a command line tool, where you know you want to have all those options and dash something flags, and somehow, you know, instead of being able to say dash something, they have to expose each possible thing here with regular expressions and so on. Some tools are kind of nicely done in the command line tool, and it's sort of hard to imagine exactly what that's going to look like um, as a uh, UI counter. There's a little, while you're waiting, I took the liberty of developing the UI. Can you review it for me? User friendly mode, lock exceptions, byte offset, kill, bash nine, exec, da da da. Uh, what is it? What do you mean? It's our CD player. Hey, don't give me that Stony player. I'm a user too, right? The problem is, when we write code, we're the user, and we're familiar with stuff. It's really easy to just put a bunch of stuff up there that helps us with our complete inside knowledge of what's going on, um, and not think about the more general users for these, these sorts of things. All right, so uh, don't lose sight of usability in this next in the next project. Um, I want to talk a little bit about UI stuff, just to kind of maybe get you thinking about it a little bit. And my computer is kind of going crazy about something here. Hold on a second. Let's get this. That's something running in the back there. I'm just going to. All right. So. Some of you, I think I did this in 1410, the other one 1410, but I'm not sure it's stuck, so we'll try it again anyway. So. Uh, Donald Norman's a famous name in just sort of design of things, not necessarily computer programs. And it's worth some day to sort of read. He has some nice books out, read a book or two on this stuff. Um, and he sort of has laid out the nice principles for how these things might work. So, one issue is. When you have a user interface, you're trying to present information to the user, and you want to make sure something is easily understood. So what's wrong with this car dashboard? Even though you see it every day, it's like a very standard kind of dashboard for performance kind of cars. Right? Uh, you have to be old kind of what things are, or is the same thing very obvious what they are? Yeah, I mean, certainly there's some stuff, like I have no idea what the little lights are, for sure. But, but these big things, what's the problem with these big things here? That's what I said. I don't like about it. What's that? Something I don't like about it is that like they're close enough in the same like range that they should just have the same range. Like this goes zero to eighty-five, and that goes zero to seventy. So I'd like them to both just go to eighty-five, like 
why not just have them? Well, I think that would make things even worse. <laughs> <laughs> because what are these things? That's a, that's a real critical thing here. Right? Well, the two pages that look almost identical, that are displaying different information. What are, the, what are the pieces of information? What is your speed? <laughs> that's a mile per hour. Which yeah. is miles per hour. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How can I just read that right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's miles per hour. And what's this one over here? Yeah. It's like your yeah. Yeah. tachometer, yeah. right? Yeah. right? It's your engine yeah. revs. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you can make it even closer, it'd be harder to fall apart. So, I mean, it's, you know, again, Everyone sort of, and there's a tiny curve, everyone's used to this kind of setup, that's how most cars look, but you still have to be, sort of be trained to look left for your speed and right for, I don't know why you care, but you're running out, I mean, you're all burning, and, you know, red light, engine, all that. Uh, here's a more modern example. So Nissan Leaf, and it's got actually got a really bunch of dumb stuff on it, to be honest. Um, and I, uh, this is the battery charge here, and she was very similar looking one. I guess car people love these, you know, symmetry of dials or something like that. This is actually battery temperature, which, as far as I can tell, unless it's like here, you really never care about whatsoever. So this is like this could be like this big, and it wouldn't cause you any any problems. Uh, so anyway, people sometimes go for some sort of cool look or something, but don't think about usability and even things. Like, sometimes it's hard to tell on web pages or apps, like, is that something I can click? You know, it's sort of highlighted, it looks like something that maybe is a link, right? But it's hard to tell, and it's really embarrassing when you click something that's not a link, <laughs> and it's just a header, and you're like, dang it, man. You know, <laughs> and, uh, so if you make it, you know, underline it or put something, button on it, you, so it invites action. Um, that's a, a good idea. Uh, it's important to have a good conceptual model. So if people do stuff, they should understand what's going to go on underneath. Like, what is this going to actually do to the data or something that's, that's happening? Um, and without that, you sort of you just sort of click buttons and hope for the best. You can't really be a power user of your application. Uh, for example, like the thermostat. Many people misuse thermostats. So how do, how do people in your life misuse the house thermostat? <laughs> Uh, they turn it to a level that's not acceptable by your dad. Not acceptable by what? By the dad. By the dad. <laughs> <laughs> they don't understand the underlying model of the, <laughs> of the house, but it's, it's, that's okay. So, someone else? Yeah. They go to the extreme that they turn on heat to 90 degrees and then down to 50. So what, what, why do they do that? Why, why does someone... They want it now. And does that make it go faster? No, so people turn the thermostat way, you know, they're cold, they turn it up to 95, right? And yet, it really just means go on when it's colder than this and turn off when it's warmer than that. Not like there's a turbo boost mode on your <laughs> house. Um, so that's like the wrong model, right? People mis misuse it. And they get frustrated when it doesn't rank up too fast. Refrigerators also have some similar thing like this, so, you know, there's, there's like numbers representing how cold you want each thing to be, and you kind of think if you change the coldness one for the freezer and change the coldness for the fridge, there's some sort of independent action going on here, and that's often not the case. Uh, more typically, most refrigerators have like a cooling unit and then some sort of baffle that shovels cold air between either the refrigerator or the freezer. And so if you change one, you're actually changing both because you're sort of stealing from the other side. And so it's sort of weird that you make your freezer colder and then your fridge gets warmer and you don't think they should be related, right? So that's frustrating. So there's two dials and there's two parts and you know their underlying model is just is wrong for this reason. So it's a mistake to kind of portray it as that. Uh, okay, da, 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 da. All right, so here's a drawer. That's really hard to see. Still hard to see. So how do you open the drawer? Yeah, I pulled in below. Right, the handle is the whole thing. And where do we see that more often in real life? Like this kind of problem of not knowing how to interact with something. 
doors. Yeah, so yeah, doors, doors, right? Like, <laughs> like when there's a big, big pull handle, and yeah, you're supposed to push it instead. So you pull on it, and you just like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and again, people are looking for a certain like aesthetic look, but it causes trouble for people in real life. And there are ways in, in graphical interfaces to do this right. You can, you basically, most button widgets have sort of a raised look to them that sort of indicates there's something that can be depressed on that. Um, there's ideas of having sort of like things that are familiar, like if you click the logo on a home page, you know, on some sort of pages, it's taken back to the sort of starting point, the home page for it. And I find it frustrating when I'm like trying to get out of something and I. You know, the nice little upper left with a logo, and you click on it, and it's just like, no, I'm just a logo, right? Um, there's a problem of false affordances. In other words, you give the information that looks like you're inviting some kind of action, like a colored header again, so it's not really a link. And then something that sort of fall out of favor is this idea of skewing morphism, um, where you make the interface look like a real world. For a while, Apple was really big on this. You know, all their apps look like a book, you know, they have a bookshelf, and you pull the book off the bookshelf, and it's like a you know, like a picture of a book kind of thing. And then they sort of went totally the opposite direction there now, just sort of be like, you know, stark black and white kind of, kind of thing. So, uh, mapping is important. So, again, what many of you have dealt with the issue of a nice uh, range top. And then there's a set of dials that controls the heat, you know, and you sort of have to study very carefully to turn on the correct one. Um, and that's, you know, dangerous if you do it wrong, basically, right? You have some raw burner going or under a pan that then I put in and it just sort of you know melts the pan kind of thing. This one is again kind of hard to see. There's five burners here and the dials are at least laid out and it's like a mini map kind of version of the burners. And so you know maybe it's more distinctive kind of thing. It's important to have constraints. Some of you are doing this in your spread editor. Don't let people click things that, that don't make any sense in that context, right? So um, gray out stuff that, that you can't do. You did that for the uh, Simon game. Um, anyway, that helps people understand what's allowed and sort of what, what the current model is. Want to make sure you have feedback about consequences of action. So common ones in the real world, and a clicker on your turn signal. You hit that, you hear click, click, click. You see a little light, click, click, click. And it lets you know that it's activated, right? Otherwise, you're just guessing. Can people, you know, is it, did I do it or not? Um, but it's sort of remarkable to me how many people do continue to drive with their clicker going for you know five miles before they, they recognize it. So it's still not everything. Um, people try to do that, like on web pages, little you know some progress bars and so on. The issue is that you know if they lie, it's, it's bad. So you get a progress bar, and it goes and then stalls for five minutes, and then and then and you know you're just like, what is going on here? You know. Um, so I don't think you have to be careful how you use this kind of Kind of feedback. But like the sprite editor, for example, it's nice to have if you draw a line, you show what the line would look like in some sort of you know half transparency kind of way, and then you finish it and, and the line, line appears. Um, also, you know, maybe you have different pen modes, fill. How how can you show what mode you're in in the sprite editor so people can get some feedback? And you know when they click, you know what kind of action's gonna happen. You can have like a little pixel following the mouse of that specific. Let's show where it is, but what kind of, you know, there's like flood fill versus pen versus spray brush or something like that. What, what could it do? You can have like the button like push, <coughs> push or something like that. So on the side, you could highlight or something like that, have the button. Anything else you can think of? You can change the icon of your mouse. You can change the cursor icon, yeah. So it looks sort of like yeah, whatever's going to happen a little bit. Just give a little, just give a little feedback, yeah. Those are all pretty common kinds of things. Um, all right, so usability is, you know, it's, it's downplayed a lot in some ways, but as you move from applications to print stuff in the console, it is important to keep it in mind. And, and, you know, you should, I think once you get in the right mindset, it's not any harder to make a nice looking application than a bad looking application. You just have to kind of get yourself wanting to make a, a good application. Uh, for usability, you know, people get angry and frustrated, <coughs> increase productivity, higher errors. Physical, emotional injury, equipment damage, loss of customer loyalty. I think we actually should be good, even without you know graphic design kind of ideas. We should be good at interfaces because we think about how, for example, in a C++ class, how 
people should interact with that class? What's a useful way to give access to the underlying data? Um, for example, the recovery <coughs> kind, of, kind of stuff. Um, so you have some practice in kind of thinking about what are reasonable ways to make a class usable. And I think some of the same ideas apply in user interfaces. All right, so anyway, just kind of QT gives you a lot of stuff and, and you know, just poke around, Google some stuff, see what you can do. Um, it can help you make your interfaces look really nice. All right, so the next project is an educational app. And here's some kind of young examples, right? Uh, count up to 20. Man, I can spend like six months working on that app and finally get to level five, you know? Uh, I, I'm not sure what this one is really, to be honest. Hopefully we're not just shooting the deer, I don't know, but identifying stuff. <laughs> and then some kind of friendly looking thing with, with states, right? So, okay, so I want you to think broadly. So I do not want a typing tutor. I do not want a flashcard. There's one more I was kind of down on. I said in the assignment somewhere, let's see. Uh, like probably a math, math thing or something like that, you know, learning multiplication kind of things. I would much prefer someone in your group has some cool or at least bizarre hobby and <laughs> you want to teach us about something about that, that field. That to me is much, I mean, I, I'm much more interested in learning something watching these presentations um, than about, uh, you know, counting or something like that. So. So think about something that at least one person in your group is, is excited about or interested in. And, and it can be really pretty much anything. Um, doesn't have to be a game, right? Other things are sort of game-like. A game's not a bad way to go, but it should at least be somehow engaging. Um, there's at least one requirement. You have to use a physics engine, Box 2D, to at least make things live up a little bit. It doesn't have to be a fundamental part of the application. It could be like your your splash screen somehow looks interesting, or the buttons on the UI are bouncing around a little bit or something. Um, and in fact, it's sort of a bad idea. A lot of people see this and then they say, let's make an app to teach physics. And then it actually is a lot harder than you think to kind of use this to kind of really teach physics. So I would kind of discourage that for the most part. Um, so just think the physics engine is thing that help an help animate things without you having to hand it a little bit. So things can move and fall and bounce around. Your your winning screen can be exciting, you know, and stuff like that. All right. So you got to teach something. Don't lose sight of your mission. Is to teach something, but then also it should somehow be engaging or interesting to to use. All right, yeah, no flashcard, no typing tutor, no math attack. So those are all like 1970 educational app kind of things, and we can move on past that. Now, one thing uh, that I'm worried about is for the sprite editor, you went around and looked at five or six sort of things that acted as sprite editors, and you sort of saw what those looked like. Um, and so you had sort of some some goal or vision in your head, perhaps, of what a successful sprite editor looks like. And you know, I'd say most of you got some way towards that goal, but not not all the way. And then this is much more open ended. You know, we don't really have. It's hard to pick out what a uh, ski, you know, uh, uh, avalanche rescue app looks like. And so your target in your head is not maybe as well fixed as the sprite editor. And you're going to have to really make sure that there's some shared vision with your team for what that final product is going to look like, right? Like, how is this thing going to be an interesting, successful looking application and not just, you know, some ABC quiz kind of thing um, with a bunch of topics. So, so there's, you know, you have a lot more freedom to fail, I guess, is the, the danger here. Right, that, that you don't have this well-tested idea, this is a sprite editor, you know, people want to use it kind of thing. So you know, make sure you spend a little time thinking about that and talking a little bit with your team. 
All right, so we're going to do this in an agile way. Um, we're going to use ideas from Scrum, so we're going to have stand-up meetings. Uh, we're going to have sprints. And we used to use... I used to use Trello for this, which is a little note card system that you can scoot things over. And I kind of think GitHub projects seem to match that for the most part, but I haven't really used it. So anyway, we'll I'll try to take a look next day or two a little more. Um, so somewhere you need to have some kind of idea of tasks that go into like in you know tasks to do, tasks in process, and uh, tasks done or something like that. And I'll talk more about this uh, on Thursday. Um, there's three sprints starting on Thursday, a little tighter than I wanted. This whole Tuesday, Thursday class thing causes problems because I can't push all the way to next Tuesday before we kind of get rolling here, which means we really need to uh, kind of get this, these teams formed and ideas done like pretty, pretty fast here. You can have lab and class times to meet, do your stand-up meetings, and this should all be in QT and C++. Okay, so by Thursday, <coughs> form teams of six or seven. Uh, so there's going to be some reshuffling around, possibly. Uh, don't be shy about reforming your teams. And there's a spreadsheet, kind of like it was for the you sign up with a team name and list of people. And then, really, the important thing is. You didn't have to do this with the sprite editor, but you need to okay a concept with me. So you need to, on Piazza, send to instructors, which goes between the TAs, and then the rest of your teammates, and say, here are three sentences, what we think we're going to do with our project. All right? And then I'm going to either say, that round sounds great, or I'm going to ask you some questions. And I also think it would be bad to like talk to me after class today or Thursday and kind of just have a little more back and forth real quick on this kind of thing. Um, and again, you need to have some kind of Wednesday slot. You can all attend either lab or Give me examples of previous educational things that you've seen to give us a little bit of inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no. <laughs> uh, let's see. There's a dog training app. There was something on computer science topics. There was uh, typing tools. Uh, really, it's, it's and it's, it's more about like your own interest, right? Someone your team should be I don't want to squelch that and say yeah, we should have just like twenty CS like learn about binary apps. Or Something typing. Yeah, typing. Yeah. Uh, anyway, wait for your, get your team to brainstorm a little bit. Uh, when I when I resolve it, you're done. Basically, on Piazza, right? So there's some back and forth, and you say we're done. Um, and, and I think sometimes I. I it's a useful process to at least go back and forth a little bit on this because I can ask you some questions about like how exactly are you going to I don't know you know just I, I think I can provide some value in defining your concepts. Okay, so here sort of hard to understand calendar. We're on the twelfth here, so this this is a two day planning phase to get your team and, and kind of get your your team okay. And then you start sprint one, and at the end of a sprint, what do you need to have? Stand up meetings. meetings all throughout the sprint. At the end of the sprint, what do you need to have? Valuable working software. It doesn't mean the whole thing. It means that something has to be working, right? Something has to to run. Um, and we'll do a little checking in the lab on, on the status of that. Obviously, you know, like you want something running, but you know, it's like it's only one week, and we got you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> don't don't panic about those. But we want to see some progress, right? Uh, second spread, I'm kind of ignoring the Thanksgiving days as anything, right? 
And then there's a final sprint. This is the last day of classes. We present on the 10th. This is our final slide. All right, it's gonna be pretty fast paced because it's two hours. Uh, gives you like, you know, about five minutes. And so anyway, there's this time period at the end of the final sprint to the presentation that's a little undefined. You got other exams going on, right? I don't want to be taking up a lot of time here, but, but there's some time there to sort of tidy things up, we'll say, and make your presentation. So there's, you know, there's a little undefined time at the end here where things can happen. Um, but there really is a pretty good chunk of time here. Um, but the important thing is to make some progress throughout this time period and not just at the end. That's really the critical cool thing. The question about that schedule part. Each one of these sprints is going to have its own little sub-assignment. So right now, Right now, there's a little tiny assignment for the plan that's posted, and there's sort of an overall assignment. It doesn't look like a big deal, but it's 100 points. But each of these are also going to be some sort of, you know, 50-point kind of deal where your stand-up meeting, your <coughs> records, your working software, things like that are all part of the, uh, the score for that. Questions so far? Can you tell us like a little bit more about the lab, like what does that software do so we can better plan about how to make an actual, like the physics engine, whatever boxes you need or something like that? What is that supposed to do or what does that help you do? Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I talked about box 2D. I'd also encourage you to use this project called SFL we'll talk about next class that is a simple fast media library has more support for sprites than QT, some networking, sound, and stuff like that. Um, and of course, QT as well. And then part of the fun is getting them all work together. And let's talk about Box2D a little bit. Box2D only provides simulation. And it has like springs and friction and falling for gravity and things like that. Um, let me show an example of what it can do. Okay, so that doesn't look very exciting for sure. Uh, a lot of options here. Okay. So even though there looks like there's some stuff being drawn here, that's not part really of Box2D. It's part of an application they wrote to demonstrate Box2D. So instead, you'll be taking these underlying sort of boxes that Box2D uses and pasting an image on it as it moves around the screen, right? So this isn't too much. Okay, so... Oh, that looks like it hurt. <laughs> but, you know, more... Let's learn about volcanoes! That's not coming back. Survive, right? <clears throat> Those games are literally just images pasted on this underlying physics engine. It's like it's like ten lines of code. All that cut the rope, Angry Birds. You could write that probably in ten minutes after you learn box two D, right? So you all you all just now be just by <laughs> <laughs> just <for> that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And now you can still write this game and upload it to the Android store and be frustrated because there's like a thousand other versions of this. Uh, okay. Let's see, not really that much else. Oh, everyone knows it's kind of like these All right, so Box2D has some simple primitives, boxes and circles and stuff, and it lets them fall and interact with each other. Um, 
In tomorrow's lab, we're going to try to integrate that into a QT project, and then actually control QT in, in a sort of weird way. Right, so um, I'll give you some idea what's going on. The, and like I said, this SFML is something I'm just going to talk about as a way to kind of get more visuals on the screen more easily. Um, all right, teams. So let's be cautious forming our teams. Uh, if, if your team wants to split apart, we shouldn't feel bad, right? You gave it a try. It, it, maybe it's time to move on to other things. If some other group wants to move on away from you, you know, maybe reflect on it a little bit, but don't take it too personally, right? So there are opportunities around for new, new beginnings. Um, I think, you know, you should talk to new people a little bit. Ask them about the sprite editor a little bit. See how it went. Uh, and, you know, I guess we'll see in some ways whether the Scrum, Agile, more constant feedback kind of mechanism supports better interactions with the team and sort of divvying stuff up and going off in different directions. Um, I'd be interested to hear how it goes as it goes along, I guess. Since this is a longer period of time, we'll have an opportunity, like midway through, to give some feedback to this at the end, but then also at the end as your team performance. And anyway, so just, uh, just be aware there might be a little more feedback on this on this round than last time. Okay, so I really want to, since we're so short on time to get this stuff done, wrapped up by Thursday, I want to kind of give you plenty of time to one, start forming teams, and two, start kicking around some ideas. You know, brainstorm five things, pick one or two, talk to me about it, uh, see how it goes. All right.